Hello friends, as I continue my journey along the winding waters of the Indus River, the ever-changing landscape around me serves as a reminder of the dynamic nature of human civilizations. This river, which once gave life to one of the most advanced societies of the ancient world, now gently flows beneath a sky filled with the hues of dusk. Today, as my canoe glides along the water, I will delve into one of the most intriguing aspects of the Indus Valley civilization, its governance and social structure. The Indus Valley civilization was not only remarkable for its urban planning, trade, and technology, but also for the order and structure that allowed it to flourish. What kind of governance did the people of the Indus Valley have? How was their society organized? And what roles did individuals play in maintaining the balance of such a complex and bustling civilization? As I drift on the Serene River, it is fascinating to think about how the people of the Indus Valley, with their advanced urban centers and sophisticated engineering, would have organized themselves to ensure the smooth running of society. Unfortunately, the Indus Valley script remains undeciphered, so our understanding of their government is limited, but we can still piece together clues from the archaeological record. Unlike other ancient civilizations, such as Mesopotamia or Egypt, where centralized kingdoms ruled by powerful kings were common, the Indus Valley appears to have had a more decentralized form of governance. In the absence of palaces or grand monuments dedicated to kingship, there is no evidence that a single powerful ruler governed over the entire civilization. Instead, what we see are large, well-organized cities that suggest a form of collective governance or city-state model. This system might have been based on cooperation among local leaders, each responsible for a city or region within the Indus Valley. The cities of Harappa, Mohenjo-Daro, and others were marvels of urban planning. They were laid out with streets in a grid pattern, a clear indication of thoughtful planning and decision-making. Each city was equipped with advanced infrastructure, such as drainage systems, wells, and public baths, which indicates a form of organized administration responsible for city management and public welfare. These systems would have required collaboration and oversight, suggesting that there was a well-organized, possibly bureaucratic structure in place to maintain and regulate these public works. Interestingly, there is no evidence to suggest that this governance was hereditary or that there was a powerful elite ruling over others. Instead, the people of the Indus Valley may have lived in a relatively egalitarian society. Excavations have not uncovered signs of monumental palaces or grand tombs typical of other ancient civilizations, indicating that the Indus people may not have placed much emphasis on hierarchy or the glorification of rulers. This might mean that governance was more communal, with individuals possibly chosen to manage certain duties or functions based on skill and expertise, rather than birthright or family lineage. The social structure of the Indus Valley civilization is also an intriguing subject. While the lack of written records makes it difficult to reconstruct their exact social hierarchy, the evidence we do have offers some insight. The standardization of weights and measures, as well as uniform building practices, suggests a society that was organized and regulated by shared norms and practices. This uniformity across the vast region of the Indus Valley indicates that there was a strong sense of social cohesion and shared responsibility. In terms of daily life, the presence of large, well-planned homes and public structures suggests that there was some form of social stratification. Wealthier individuals likely lived in larger houses with access to more advanced amenities, such as private wells and bath areas. Smaller, more modest homes would have been reserved for the common people. While there seems to be evidence of wealth disparity, the overall picture is one of a society that placed emphasis on order, cleanliness, and mutual cooperation. An important feature of the Indus Valley social structure was its focus on communal projects and public works. From the construction of drainage systems to the maintenance of public wells, it is clear that the people of the Indus Valley worked together to ensure the prosperity and well-being of their cities. This cooperation suggests that there may have been a form of democratic decision-making in place, where the needs of the community were prioritized over individual interests. Another aspect of governance in the Indus Valley was the importance of trade. The Indus Valley was one of the most active trading regions of the ancient world. 
engaging in commerce with distant lands such as Mesopotamia. This trade required sophisticated administrative systems to manage the exchange of goods, resources, and information. The presence of standardized weights and measures across the region suggests that there was a centralized authority or collective system overseeing trade and ensuring fairness in transactions. As I paddle along the Indus River, I wonder about the possibility of specialized leaders or merchants who might have played key roles in the regulation of trade, commerce, and urban management. Although we have no concrete evidence of a king or central ruler, these specialized roles would have contributed to the overall order and prosperity of the civilization. In many ways, the leadership in the Indus Valley might have been more functional and practical focusing on maintaining infrastructure, facilitating trade, and ensuring that the cities remained orderly and safe. The governance and social structure of the Indus Valley civilization present a fascinating portrait of a society that was ahead of its time. Its emphasis on communal responsibility, trade, and cooperation laid the foundation for the civilization's success and longevity. Unlike many other ancient societies where rulers held absolute power and society was divided into rigid classes, the Indus Valley appears to have fostered a more egalitarian and functional system of governance. As my canoe continues its journey down the river, I am struck by how the people of this ancient civilization managed to create such a harmonious society. The Indus Valley civilization may not have had kings or grand palaces, but it had something equally remarkable a well-organized, cooperative society that was capable of great achievements in trade, infrastructure, and governance. Perhaps it is this spirit of unity and shared responsibility that allowed the civilization to thrive for so long. In the next episode, we will explore the impact of climate change on the Indus Valley civilization. How did shifts in climate affect the development and eventual decline of this once thriving civilization? What lessons can we learn from their experiences as we face the challenges of our own time? As the sun dips below the horizon and the cool breeze of the river gently brushes my face, I continue to reflect on the river's significance. The Indus River, a timeless force of nature, carries with it the memory of a civilization that flourished along its banks. It is a reminder that even the most advanced societies are vulnerable to the changes of the world around them. But, as we journey together through these stories, we remember that history is a continuous flow, just like the river beneath us, carrying its legacy forward into the future.